Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly wrap up where I talk about what I read in the past week. I continue to feel a bit strange about my reading. I'm on fire to start all the things, which is good because I have a lot of unread books I need to read, but I haven't been so good at finishing all the stuff I'm starting. I've like hit a bottleneck here and so I'm just finishing the things that are very short or very quick to read. I also haven't felt very analytical recently, mostly because my brain feels fried from stress and anxiety about what's going on in the world right now, but also I have some personal things going on that I gotta deal with. And if you've ever experienced anxiety, you know that it just taxes and leeches away your energy to do things. And I, I find it difficult to film videos when I feel like I'm making bad ones because my thinking isn't so good. <laughs> but then I feel guilty for not making videos because doing this, I mean, I'm clearly doing it right now, it makes me feel better after I've done it. There is no solution to this problem. Today I am also dealing with all the noises my dog is making, plus all the rowdy children outside because it's a beautiful weekend and I couldn't wait for any other time to film, so sorry if it's very distracting. The first thing I finished this week was a novella, The Dream Quest of Velvet Bow by Kate Johnson, which is her response to or retelling of Lovecraft's original story, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadoth, which I haven't read. In this version, Velvet Bow is a professor at a women's college in the Dreamlands, and one of her best students disappears. She elopes with a dreamer, who is a man from the waking world, and Velvet Bow goes off to find her and bring her back to save her part of the Dreamlands from being destroyed by the cantankerous gods of this world. Since I have not read the original story and I haven't read Lovecraft ever and I don't intend to at this point, I don't know really how Johnson is playing with the Lovecraftian mythos and I'm not sure that I got the full richness of the story and the impact of Johnson's subversion of the original very sexist, very racist story. Nevertheless, I thought it was very enjoyable just on its own and I assumed that the world building was all Lovecraft whereas the characters, because most of them are female, were Johnson's. I really loved the main character, Velvet Bow, because she was an older woman. She's a professor at this point, but you get this look at her past life when she was an adventurer. She went on these excursions around the world. She, she did things in a manner that's not expected of women in the dreamlands. I really liked this aspect of her character. And then I also really liked the writing of the novella. I first was introduced to Johnson last year when I read her collection At the Mouth of the River of Bees, and I love her storytelling, I love her style, and so I had a pretty high expectation of the quality of the story, which was very much met. So I would really recommend this novella. I think it's one of the better ones I've read from Tor.com's line, though I cannot escape this feeling that I missed something because I hadn't read the original. Next I finished Reality Is Not What It Seems by Carlo Rovelli, which is a nonfiction popular physics book explaining what loop quantum gravity is, which is a theory that competes with string theory and a lot of other theories to explain the nature of the universe and gravity. Rovelli chooses to explain quantum gravity by first explaining the history of all the major conceptions humans have had about the nature of the universe first, because all of these ideas are incremental and build on each other to eventually reach quantum gravity. You have to understand what came first to understand what is now. So the book spans from antiquity through major periods like Newton and Einstein up to the modern day. Pretty much baseline, I enjoyed this because I have read very, very little, if nothing at all, about quantum gravity. Most of the popular physics books seem to focus on string theory as it's kind of like the sexy theory out of all of them, but quantum gravity may have a bit more evidence behind it now from results from the Large Hadron Collider, so I just liked knowing more about this topic. I also appreciated that Rovelli uses different techniques and metaphors to explain these concepts because sometimes you need a concept explained to you in more than one way multiple times to fully grasp it. So Rovelli seemed to take a different tack than other books I've read and that helped me understand some things, but I felt like I lost the thread of what 
what things were by the end of the book when it was really describing quantum gravity, which I don't feel very bad about because it's really complicated and a lot of really smart scientists don't seem to completely understand it either. The big disappointment of this book for me is that I've heard so much rapturous praise for Rovelli's style and his other book, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, that I expected the prose in reality is not what it seems to be better or to be more noteworthy, and instead I thought it was just adequate. Some people seem to think his style is very flowery and florid or something. I don't think it is. I think that unusual for this topic, he sometimes goes off on digressions about the arts, about Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, which is like a really long epic scientific poem, and also Dante's The Divine Comedy, which I really like because I enjoy it when people like recognize there is significant overlap and connection between the arts and the sciences. I think that the divide between the two is very artificial and harmful because these things benefit from each other. I finally got back to reading The Apollo Quartet by Ian Sales. Uh, last year I read the fourth book and now I have read Adrift on the Sea of Rains, which is the first story. It's actually a novella because it's very short. Uh, I think you can read these stories in any order. I mean, I've only read two of the four, but they are all unconnected and it's a series based on theme rather than on continuity between the stories. Adrift on the Sea of Rains is about a group of astronauts who are stranded on the moon at a moon base when the Earth is destroyed in a nuclear war. They happen to have this Nazi artifact with them called the Bell that when they figure out how to use it, it shifts them to different timelines and they are using it to look for what they call evolutions where the Earth still exists and nuclear war was averted so that they can go home. They do manage to find a promising evolution, but then they have to figure out how to get off the moon and to the orbiting space station to make contact, and they don't know what country is the world power. They don't know if it's the US or Russia or China or some other country. I really enjoyed this story because it felt like a classic science fiction story in the time period and the type of characters, and it particularly reminded me of James Tiptree Jr.'s short fiction from the setting in the 60s or 70s to the characters being men and being astronauts, and then the ending of the story, this particular dark zinger of a moment was very tiptree, and I enjoy her fiction, and so I very much liked this one. I, I kind of thought of it as an homage to those older types of stories, whether it was intended to be or not. I think it was very similar in a positive way. Remnant Population by Elizabeth Moon. I've been meaning to read this for a long time, ever since I was reading the Vada's War series. I was like, do I really want to get into another long SFF series? And then I realized this is a standalone science fiction novel, which is cool. Um, this is about Ophelia, a 70-year-old woman who stays behind on a planet when everybody else leaves. She's been there for 40 years with a group of colonists. Their colony and the planet are managed by a corporation, and when the company hits on hard times, they have to dissolve the colony and take all the colonists away and send them in cryosleep for 30 years to another planet. Ophelia is old enough that she probably won't survive the cryosleep, and she's kind of a burden on her family. They don't think very highly of her. She's just an old, useless woman in their thinking. So she decides that she's not going to go. She's put her whole life, her blood, her sweat, her tears, and most of her family into this planet, into this colony, and she isn't gonna live to make a whole new life somewhere else. She manages to hide and stay behind, and then she is the only person left on the planet. It gives her a lot of freedom. For the first time in her life, it's like she's rediscovering childhood, that she can do whatever she wants to do. She can play, she can have fun, she can spend all day in her garden, whatever she wants to do, and there's nobody there to be derogatory, to castigate her, to make her feel guilty, to make her feel useless. And it's, it's like she rediscovers all the pleasures in life. It's wonderful. And then she makes this stunning discovery that she is not alone on the planet, and the rest of it is a first contact story. I loved this story. I loved reading about an old woman. Unlike a lot of science fiction stories, this is not about rejuvenation or technologies and, and medical advances that can bring back youth when you're very old. Ophelia is old. She's in her 70s. She has physical problems. She might be losing her memory a little bit. She knows she's gonna die. 
but she's gonna be happy now. That was so nice. Sometimes, sometimes it's good to not just read stories about young people. <laughs> And then I just liked the story so much. It was really sad with these realizations about Ophelia's family and her community and how undereducated and undervalued a lot of them were and how she has been this way her entire life that she has to discover the value and the meaning of her own life so late when it's almost too late. And then when it, it goes into the first contact storyline it went exactly the way that I really wanted it to in my heart, and that was just so satisfying. So that's a big fat recommendation from me. Then I read another novella. This one is called The New Mother by Eugene Fisher, and it's a Tiptree Award winner, so it's been on my radar for a while, but I initially balked at reading it when I discovered what it's about, because it's about a sexually transmitted disease that makes it possible for infected women to reproduce by parthogenesis, so they're giving birth to female clones of themselves without any male assistance, and the men who are infected with this are sterile and cannot reproduce at all. So there is this great concern that the concept of motherhood and reproduction is being completely rewritten and men may die out. I am not always comfortable or happy reading about issues like this when women's rights to their own bodies are under attack, especially when it draws in the religious fundamentalist aspect because, you know, I live in the United States and pretty much every day we have some sort of very Christian sect saying, you can't do that. And also, you know what's going on in the world right now. Um, so, you know, reading about this doesn't make me very happy. But nevertheless, I actually got into this story quite a bit, except for the end, because the story is being told by a journalist who is uh, researching and writing about this condition while she is pregnant with her and her partner's first child, and she doesn't know if she is infected or not. So the ending, I think, is supposed to be kind of an answer to that question, but it was so ambiguous, I did not know what the final scene implied at all. And I was disappointed by that, because, you know, is that my failure as a reader to have picked up on all the clues, or was it too ambiguous? I guess I would recommend the story to people who are interested in things like the mission statement of the Tiptree Awards, uh, if they want to read stories that do something interesting with gender, because this absolutely does that. And last, I read The Egg and I by Betty McDonald. McDonald wrote the Mrs. Piggle Wiggle stories for children, which are like classics. I know I read them when I was a kid. And she's also like really famous for her fictionalized autobiographies, of which The Egg and I was the first. This is a kind of fictionalized memoir of her time living on a chicken farm with her husband in the 1920s in Washington State. And I would recommend it for the really vivid and beautiful passages about the land and the weather and, and what it was like to have this beautiful garden and work with the chickens and everything. The lifestyle in this particular place at this particular time was really interesting. It's a very like American last frontier type of place. However, by the end of this book, I was unhappy with some aspects of it that just really ruined the experience for me. And the first one, the major one that everybody has to mention is that there's a chapter in here that is extremely racist towards Native Americans. It is ugly, and I don't think there's any defense for it. She says a couple of completely unforgivable things about Native Americans, and it's awful. The whole book would be improved like 200 times over if that whole chapter just didn't exist. And then the thing that was more subtle but also very troubling to me by the end is that McDonald's caricatures of her neighbors is supposed to be one of the funniest things in this book, but I couldn't help thinking that her, her lampooning of these people, whether they're fictionalized or not, was a little too cruel because she's picking on people who are underprivileged, disadvantaged, a lot of very uneducated and poor people, and a lot of women who are the victims of sexism and domestic abuse. And making fun of people like this is not cool. There's this concept of punching up instead of down in humor. This just jumped out to me as a case of you shouldn't make fun of people like this, especially when she's coming from a slightly elitist angle where she comes from a better background of more money and more education than these people do. Just, eh. 
So there are some pretty big negatives to this book, but I still thought it was humorous in places, and I and I would like to read McDonald's other autobiographies and just hope that they are improved by not repeating some of the mistakes in this one. Those are all the things that I finished this past week, and I look forward to finishing a bunch of the books I've been in the middle of for a while and talking about them next week. So I hope you have a wonderful week that you get lots of reading done, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.